All righty, good morning. I'm Donovan Richards, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. And this morning we are joined by Council Members Chen, Reynoso, Torres, uh, Gentili, and Rose, and I believe I saw Cumbo. Uh, we will be holding a public hearing on several applications this morning. Four sidewalk cafes, land use items number 631, 632, 647, and 648. We'll also be hearing the Watson Avenue rezoning, land use items number 649 and 650. The 1350 Bedford Avenue rezoning, land use items number 651 and 652. Next, the 55-57 Spring Street Tex amendment, land use items number 653. And then uh, the 125 Edgewater development, land use items number 654 and 655. And we'll be laying over uh, both items, land use items 643 and 644, uh, 251 uh, Front Street. We now will be hearing, uh, call the first uh, item, a hearing for Watson Avenue rezoning application, land use items number 649 and 650. This application includes a rezoning action that would establish an R7A slash C1-4 overlay district instead of the existing R5 with a C1-2 overlay district. And a zoning text amendment to apply the mandatory inclusionary housing area on the property. These actions would facilitate the development of 286 units of affordable housing with units reserved for incomes ranging from 30% AMI to 80% of the area median income, with 70 units reserved for senior housing. The development would be located on the site of an existing church and parking lot. The new development would also include over 10,000 square feet for a new church facility. This application is located in Councilmember Palmer's district. I will now open the public hearing on land use items number 649 and 650, and we'll call up the applicants, Richard Bates, 1755 Watson, Guido, I'm going to butcher your name, Subo Tavaski, 1755 Watson Street, Pastor Joe's, I believe. Jobs, Jobs, 1755 Watson, and Emmanuel D. Moore, 1755 Watson Avenue. Uh, I'll just ask you before you speak to state your name for the record and who you're representing, and then you may begin. And any members here or anybody from the public who's here uh, for the franchises uh, agreement hearing between charter on charter, uh, that hearing is after uh, we go through these land use items today. So just wanted to make sure everyone's aware. You may begin. And you'll hit your button, it'll light up, and then you may begin. Light up red? Hit your, yeah. Uh, no, do it again. It'll How about now? There, there you go. Just put the mic a little closer so we can okay. hear Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Richards uh, and Council Members. I'm Richard Bass. Uh, I'm with Aikman LLP. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Bronx Pentecostal Center, uh, a church who is a co-applicant with Azimuth Development. The project is known as th 1755 Watson Avenue. Uh, the church has been at this site for 30 years. Uh, it was an industrial building that was converted to a church 30 years ago. Uh, the proposal is to uh, demolish the existing church building and build approximately 286 units of affordable housing. The project is 100% affordable. Uh, just one correction, Chair uh, Richards. Uh, the AMI count is 10% of the units will be at shelter rents. 10% as at 30 AM, uh, 30 percent AMI, 10 percent at 40 percent AMI, 10 percent at 50 percent AMI. We start again. So 10 percent is shelter rent. Okay, and sorry, I'm talking so fast. Oh, no problem, no problem. Um, 10%, I'm just a little slow. Uh, I haven't had my coffee yet, too. <laughs> uh, 10 percent at shelter rents. Uh, 10 percent at 30 percent AMI. 10 percent at 40 percent AMI. 10 percent at 50 percent AMI. 30% at 60% AMI, and 30% at 80% AMI. Uh, what at 80? The, the last is 30% at 80. 30% at 80. Very so nice. the entire project is 100% uh, affordable. As you mentioned, there's two actions that's being proposed. 
uh, a mapping amendment to change the R5, R5C12 to an R7A C14 uh, commercial overlay. Uh, this would facilitate the redevelopment of the church and uh, 286 units of affordable housing. We received favorable re recommendation from the community board, from the planning commission, from the borough president, and the council member has submitted a letter in support of the project. I'm here today with Pastor Jones, the pastor of the church, uh, his co-developer, uh, uh, the president of Azimuth Development, and the architect. If you have questions, we can answer those, uh, or I can go into greater detail about the, the design of the project. What's your preference, Chair? Uh, let's get through details. Can you go through the job scenario, how you're going to ensure local residents have access to jobs at the site? Is this a union job or non-union? Good morning. Uh, my name is Guido Subotovsky. I'm the president of Azimuth Development Group. Uh, we are a mixed-income housing developer primarily in the Bronx. Speak a little closer into the mic. Is that better? Uh, to answer your question with respect to local hiring, uh, local hiring is uh, you know, a very important part of the way that we structure our projects. Uh, our partner, the, Pen the Bronx Pentecostal Deliverance Center, has a longstanding following in the Bronx, and uh, they will be spearheading local hiring efforts from our development throughout the community within Community Board 9 and the Council Member Palmas District. Uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a union project as an affordable housing development group uh, development, but... Um, local hiring efforts will be ongoing and reporting will be, I'm not sure if quarterly or And any percentage goals on local hiring and MWBE procurement as well? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have an MWBE requirement for 25% of okay. the, uh, well, actually of the HPD allocated funds and um, local hiring efforts. Uh, obviously, we would look to maximize and we would have quarterly reporting to both the community board and the council member as to our efforts. All right, so we would love to see you and if we can get this in writing, at least a 30% effort on local hiring that would be awesome and are you working with the, you're going to work directly with the church you said on local hiring yeah the, so the church is our co-development partner so uh, okay. we'll be working directly with them and uh how will you track these jobs faster i think it'll be the monthly or quarterly say it again monthly or quarterly reports from asthma development corp so you'll get a report from yeah. them a quarterly report yeah okay um can you just go through the unit spread? So uh, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, studios. What does is, what is your unit breakdown look like? And I think the spread on your, um, your affordability is, is to be applauded. I think this is the sort of project we like to see. Hi, good morning. Emmanuel Diamor from Afghan Architects. So we have 50 uh, studios, 110 one bedrooms. 76 two bedrooms and 53 bedrooms. All righty, I think that's good. Are there any questions from my colleagues on this project? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. I think uh, this is a good project, and um, we, if you, 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 you want to add anything. No, again, th this is one of those uh, uh, applications where uh, the partnership between an affordable housing developer and the local church makes the most sense for this location, and the affordability, uh, again, is, is easy to represent. And uh, Councilmember Palmer supports this application as yes, well. Yes, she so, does. You know. So uh, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. righty, we're going to go to our next panel. Uh, William Fuller representing 32BJ today. I'll just uh, ask the applicants who came before just to reiterate before it gets to the full land use committee, a uh, letter to the committee in writing on the goals of local hiring and MWB as well. Thank you. You may begin, sir. Just state your name for the record and who you're representing. Uh, your mic needs to be lit up. All right, there you go. William Fuller, 32BJ. Good morning. My name is William Fuller. I am here today to testify on behalf of 32BJ. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service 
working union in the country. 32BJ represents 7,000 building, building service workers in New York City. Over 33,000 of us work in residential building, like the one Alma is pro possessing the develop. Over 4,000 of us live in CD9, where the progress development will be located. I'm here to tell you just how important it is to Amart committee to create a high quality job in at the 1755 Watson Avenue. My union job provides wages and benefits that allow me to support my family in New York City. I know that this is increasing difficulty to many working people that my, why my union strongly supports support building more affordable housing in the Bronx, but we, don't, we know we cannot build our way out of the affordable housing crisis. As long as hardworking people are paid pro property wages, they will struggle to make ends meet in this city. The community board recognizes how important good jobs are in it, recommend at its vote on this developer board member insists that the developer commitment to create good jobs and pay the industrial standard wages and benefit for similar jobs in the Bronx. At this point, the developer has failed to make such a commitment. Although 32BJ has reached out, we are calling on the committee to vote no on this property project. This is an important step towards ensuring that new developer in the Bronx truly benefit the neighborhood by creating high quality permanent jobs. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. you for your testimony. All righty, are there any other members of the public here who wish to testify on this issue? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items number 649 and 650 and we will now move on to uh, land use item number 631, Pate Palo Sidewalk Cafe. This is an application for approval of a re revocable consent to establish and maintain an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 251 Dykeman Street. This cafe would be located in Councilmember Rodriguez's district and he supports approval of this application. All right, are there any members of the public who are here who wish to testify on this issue? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 631. We will now move on to land use item number 632, Barking Dog Sidewalk Cafe. What a name. This is an application for approval of a revo revocable consent to establish and maintain an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 678 Third Avenue. This cafe would be located in Councilmember Ben Kalos District, and he supports approval of this application. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this sidewalk cafe? <coughs> All righty, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 632. Now we will move on to land use item number 647, Pret a manager sidewalk cafe. This is an application for approval of a revocable consent to establish and maintain an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at one Astor place. This cafe would be located in Councilmember Mendez's district. Are there any members of the public here who wish to testify on this issue? Councilmember Mendez, do you want to say anything on the sidewalk cafe? Yes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, this uh, sidewalk cafe application was called up so that we could uh, get some agreement around the tables, the hours, and uh, prior to this hearing, uh, there were also some issues uh, about garbage, and all of those issues um, have been addressed, maybe not to the satisfaction of everyone on that block, but um, they, they are proceeding with three tables, six chairs, and um, I am uh, in support of this application now as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mendez. All righty, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? 
Okay, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 647. And now we will move on to our last cafe today, which is land use item number 648, Horace Kebab House Sidewalk Cafe. This is an application for approval of a revocable consent to establish and maintain an unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 93rd Avenue B. This cafe would also be located in Councilmember Mendez's district. Are there any members? Okay, we do. All right, I'm going to call up Ashraf Sadiq from Horace Kebab House and Kathleen Nagri. I'm going to mess your stuff up. I'm going to mess your last name up. I won't even read it. Horace Cafe, uh, come on up, and we will go to Councilmember Mendez for uh, statements on it before we begin. And you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we'll be hearing from the representative of Horace Kebab House as well as um, uh, Community Board 3 on this matter. Um, we had uh, discussions back and forth for the last week and this and today, earlier today, we were uh, discussing um, some of the issues that have come up. Uh, they've agreed to um, have less tables and chairs and they've agreed to shorten the hours as to what some of the other businesses in the community board have agreed to in terms of sidewalk cafe. Um, just drafting something that you can sign um, that will be submitted into the record maybe later on. You can do it on your own letterhead, but if um, we, we love to hear from you now on this matter. Just hit your mic and state your name for the record. Uh, not hit it, literally. Um, hit the button on the mic. Uh, that would be neat if you could just hit okay, it and it went on that's now. good. Okay, uh, Kathleen Negri Stathopoulos. I'm the attorney for Horace Cafe. Uh, so originally, we were looking for uh, 13 tables, 26 seats, with hours uh, ranging uh, from Sunday through Thursday from 12 to uh, uh, 12 to 12, and then on Friday and Saturday from 12 to 1. Uh, we have compromised with the community board. We've spoken with the community board. We have agreed on, uh, on reducing the tables, first of all, to uh, 10 tables and 20 seats. Uh, the tables will be flush against the facade of the building with the three-foot service aisle uh, towards the curb. Uh, and uh, we have also agreed to a reduction of hours uh, where we would open every day at 12 o'clock and we would close uh, every day at uh, 10 o'clock with the exception of Friday and Saturday nights in which we would be open until 11. And then it is our hope, of course, in the future, we know that there's no promises that if we run our cafe uh, efficiently and in a uh, neighborly fashion that we might be able to come back to the community board in the future and request a uh, increase in hours. Okay, Councilmember Mendez, you okay? All right, so we'll request all of these things, including what she requested before uh, it gets to the Land Use Committee. Uh, so I want to thank you for coming in. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to two other public speakers, Susan <coughs> Stetzer, Community Board 3, Clinton Smeltzer, CV3, and Lower Avenue B Block Association. I, no, I don't. Okay, my name is Susan Stetzer. I'm district manager for Community Board 3, and we have agreed to this compromise. It's not the hours we looked for because there are families living upstairs, um, but we have agreed to this um, compromise of hours that will be uh, tender in the week and 11 on Friday and Saturday. And I just want to note that the zoning regulations actually treat residential neighborhoods the same as Times Square, and that is why it's necessary for us to, um, to customize agreements so that businesses and residents are not in conflict with each other. Clint Smeltzer, um, I'm a community board member. I'm also a chair of the Block Association of Lower Avenue B. Um, we met with the applicants, and you know there was a discussion about the number of tables. They agreed to reduce that to 10. They moved it to the facade to keep the service from happening outside the sidewalk cafe gives the area between the sidewalk the tables and the sidewalk for serving um, that in doing that it reduced the tables to 10 
We also asked them to reduce the hours consistent with what we have for our other cafes in the area. They did agree to 10 for the weekdays, 11 on the weekends, and I think we're, we're happy with that compromise. So. Thank you, and thank you for your, uh, your commitment to working with the uh, council member and, and the cafe owner, and compromise is a good thing, and we'll just make sure that they f keep their word and stay in touch with council member Mendez to make sure that happens. All righty, all righty, we will now close. Oh, is there, any, is there any others who wish to testify on this issue? Okay, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 649 and 650. We are now going to hold a vote on these applications and one other application that we laid over from our last meeting. We'll be voting to approve four of the sidewalk cafes, land use items number 631, 632, 648, and 647. We'll be voting to modify the Watson Avenue rezoning, land use items number 649 and 650, in order to change the text amendment to MIH option number one, requiring 25% of the floor area averaging at 60% of AMI. The application currently proposes option two. We are also going to hold a vote on land use item number 635, the 13-15 Greenpoint Avenue, text amendment in Councilmember Levin's district that was laid over from our previous meeting. This application is for a zoning text amendment that would create section 62-356 to allow the lot line separating the development site from the park to serve as a street line for purposes of applying bulk regulations. We will be voting on modification that would increase the required setback from the park to 28 feet on the residential portion and 18 feet on the commercial portion and prohibit, prohibit balconies on the side of the building facing the park and require six to 10 foot walls separating the park from the development site. These modifications would help to ensure a har harmonious transition from public to private space. I will now go to Council Member Levin uh, for statements on this application. Uh, Palmer's not here, right, and Mendez left. Um, so we will go to Levin for comments before we vote. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm going to be recommending an I vote on this uh, project, and I just want to uh, make a couple acknowledgments. Um, this has been a lengthy process working with uh, members of the community, so I just want to acknowledge uh, the friends at Transmitter Park, uh, Steve Chesler, who is here, uh, Sante Michelli, Kat, uh, Catherine Napotarski, Francesca Olivas, and Joe Mayock. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the developers, the, the Sweat family, um, for working with the community on um, reconfiguring this site, uh, working on um, uh, coming up with an agreement on a physical barrier, which is going to be a concrete wall that is going to be um, up to 10 feet tall uh, that will separate the, um, uh, the park from the development site and therefore uh, uh, ensuring, uh, in addition to a, uh, a setback from the park boundary um, into the property of uh, 20 feet on the commercial portion, or 30 feet on the commercial portion and 20 feet on the residential portion. Um, I'm sorry, other way around. 30, 30 feet on the residential portion, uh, 20 feet on the commercial portion. Um, that will ensure that there is uh, enough of a barrier between uh, the private development and the public park uh, so that there's a clear break um, and that uh, the public can continue to enjoy this passive park um, in, um, you know, in quiet and, uh, uh, and enjoy um, that aspect of, of nature on the, on the Greenpoint waterfront. Um, so I also want to um, acknowledge Nick Hawkins, who was here working with us on uh, coming to the terms of this agreement. Uh, but again, uh, the Friends of Transmitter Park, um, Parks Department, Mary Salek, who is here, as well as my staff, um, uh, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, and Ben Solitaire uh, for, for working on this project. And I appreciate uh, my colleagues uh, allowing me to speak here, and I encourage you all to vote in favor of, uh, of this application. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. I will now call a vote to approve land use items number 631, 632, 648, and 647, and approve land use item number 649, 650, and 635 with the modifications I just described. Council, please call the roll. Chair Richards. I vote aye. 
Councilmember Gentili. Councilmember Reynoso. Councilmember Torres. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the um, one moment. Land use items 631, 632, 647, and 648 are approved, and land use items 649, 650, and 635 are approved with modifications, and all items are referred to the full land use committee. All right, we'll hold this vote open. All right, next we will have land use items number 654 and 655, the 125 Edgewater Street development. This application is for a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of a three mixed use building, three mixed use buildings, including approximately 371 units of housing and 24,000 square feet of retail. The development would also provide a publicly accessible upland connection and shore public walkway. The mandatory inclusionary housing program would apply to this development and is proposed to allow for options one, option two, or the workforce option. This application is located in Council Member Debbie Rose's district. I will now open a public hearing on land use item number 654 and 655 and go to Council Member Rose for a statement if she so wishes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Richards, um, for allowing me this opportunity to speak regarding a proposed rezoning in my district at 125 Edgewater Plaza, LU 654 and 655. This is an exciting time on Staten Island's North Shore waterfront. There is a tremendous amount of economic development taking place along our waterfront, bringing housing, hotels, restaurants, and retail space for tourists and Staten Islanders alike. The amount of money being invested is unprecedented for my borough. Indeed, one can say without a hint of irony that we are living history. And it is of that history that I am ever mindful as this process unfolds. A history of overdevelopment in other parts of Staten Island, of a loss of nature's protections from floods and water damage that have made us more vulnerable, a loss of open spaces and promises made and not always kept. I have been and will continue to be very supportive of development that is environmentally safe, responsible and affordable development that will build the infrastructure to adequately support the project and will bring the promise of good jobs to my constituents both during construction and afterwards. I look forward to hearing from the applicant regarding all of these important elements of their project in today's hearing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. And uh, I know we're joined by Carolyn Harris, Ron Schulman, Chris, I'm going to mess your last name up, Nellie Manella. All righty, uh, so you may begin, and you please state your name for the record and who you're representing, and then uh, you may begin. I'm please Caroline, speak into the mic. Caroline Harris, a partner at Goldman Harris, representing Pier 21 Development, but having some technical problems. I did set this up at, before the hearing, and it was removed, and now is not opening. Error processing. Um, you do have a handout, uh, so rather than uh, delay any more with this. We heard it's partly our fault, so it's okay. <laughs> um, I apologize. I was looking forward to using it. Um, <clears throat> could I have this? <clears throat> so the, the uh, application, as you uh, already uh, revealed, and, and first of all, good morning, and thank you for letting us appear here. Um, we've met before about the project, uh, Council Member Richards and Council Member Rose, and we look forward to sharing it with the rest of the community, uh, the Council uh, Committee and the community here. Uh, 125 Edgewater Street is located in Community Board 1, uh, as you'll see on the first page of the, the second page of the handout, uh, on the eastern sh uh, shore of the north, northern portion of Staten Island. It's near the community called Rosebank. It's south of Stapleton and St. George, where uh, there's a, currently a community 
uh, city planning uh, study is going forward on Bay Street. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of development in the North Shore uh, with EDC supported projects. Uh, this project would be the first privately funded project uh, excluding issues of affordable housing. Um, uh, under the, and it would be the first mandatory inclusionary housing project on Staten Island. Uh, the proposal is to extend the special Stapleton Waterfront District, this is page three, uh, which you'll see in gray on, on the third page of the presentation. Uh, the special Stapleton Waterfront District uh, ends north of this site uh, beyond the northern border of uh, one Edgewater, and the proposal is to extend the step special Stapleton Waterfront District over one N125 Edgewater, uh, which are currently mapped as a, an M21 district. We would create two sub-districts within this extension of Stapleton on Area D, which is the, would be approximately the pouch terminal site, which is not the subject of this application, except for the extension of the Staple Waterfront, Stapleton Waterfront District, and sub area E, which is the applicant's site. The sub area E regulations <coughs> would include special use modifications, bulk regu regulations, and design requirements for the waterfront uh, public access areas and of course the mandatory inclusionary zoning uh, uh, mapping. Um, I, I'm, I'm mindful of your time, so I'll skip forward to uh, uh, details about the project. We, we, we have uh, provided in the presentation material you have why this is an appropriate extension of step special Stapleton, we've reviewed what the ULERP actions are necessary, which have, has already been reviewed by the chair, and the benefits to the community, which include uh, consistency with the Stapleton goals um, and being able to establish physical and visual public access to the water, developing new residential and commercial uses from a non-performing manufacturing site, an attractive environment, and uh, helping to build the residential community. Um, there are uh, already through variance applications projects in the neighborhood, in the immediate neighborhood, and as uh, you know, it's uh, not far from the Staten Island R Railroad Station, which we hope will be increasingly used by residents of the area. Um, and the, the property, if you look to the survey, you'll see it in blue and tan. Uh, is an L-shaped property with the longest part of the property along the waterfront, which is where this very substantial long waterfront uh, esplanade will be created. There will be public access, although on private property, from Edgewater Street at Lynnhurst going towards uh, the waterfront. Uh, that road will be paved, enhanced, landscaped, and have public parking on it um, to connect to the waterfront esplanade. The aerial view, which is further along in the application, in the, in the materials, you'll see the same L-shaped property. It uh, envelops, if you will, the pouch ter existing pouch terminal, um, which also has uh, a road, a private road, connecting from Edgewater towards our site. And our applicant has an e been granted an easement for pedestrian and vehicular e egress and access that will provide a second entrance uh, from Edgewater to the, to the project site uh, and will include uh, on, on the client's property, no, on, uh, yeah, on the client's property, the required turnaround for fire department vehicles. Uh, the area currently, if you'll see site photos on the next page, uh, is predominantly industrial or with pouch terminal offices. So this will be a shift in the use uh, of the uh, waterfront area right there and going north to being a residential area. The proposed uh, project um, is to be mapped as uh, from the M21 waterfront to an R6 with a C22 overlay. Uh, the permitted FAR would be 2.42 for residential, 4.8 for community facility, and 2 FAR for commercial. 
and we're proposing height limits that differ from the R6 standard heights to be consistent with Stapleton Waterfront. Uh, the base height is 55 feet. Maximum building heights for the tallest building will be 120. For the second building, building BC, would be 110. Um, so you can see those buildings on the front page of your handout. Building A is the one on the far left. That's the building that would be no more than 120 feet. And building B and C are, uh, building B is the uh, two towers in the center that would be 110 feet. Um, there would be a maximum of three towers. Uh, the smallest building is uh, six, six stories? Is six stories, which is the third building, building what we call building C. These will be built, uh, and we're re this is part of our request that they be built uh, in a series uh, consecutively, not have to be built all at once. This is important both for staging of the, um, uh, the construction and uh, then completion of the esplanade would be in accordance with each building being uh, constructed because there would be uh, risks and, and sort of needless activity to build the esplanade and then be having construction vehicles on it while you're building the, the apartment building. Um, there'll be a total of um, Uh, if you look to the zoning analysis page, uh, the residential building uh, to residential total will be approximately 351,567 feet. Uh, commercial 24,173 for a total floor area of 375,740. They anticipate 371 apartments, although the environmental impact statement was, uh, did consider 396 units, uh, the proposal's actually for 371, with parking spaces for uh, 346 parking spaces. Um, parking, um, just for your information, was required at 70% of market rate, 55% for affordable units, um, and the project is providing 67% parking uh, which is greater than what would have been required um, under, all, uh, under the requ zoning requirements. There are an additional 16 spaces, so we end up with 71% parking, uh, which is greater than needed under the zoning. Um, there's also required parking for the commercial space, for the commercial uses, which amounts to 81 spaces. Um, the waterfront public access area provided is uh, 52,126, which is 30,000 square feet more, more than 30,000 square feet more than required. And um, it's going to be beautiful. It'll be a beautiful, beautiful esplanade for the public to use. Um, I know there have been questions about, uh, raised by the community about parking, and the client is committed that to uh, exploring uh, if there is a demand for additional parking, if there's a demand for additional parking that's found during marketing, uh, they will be able to put additional parking spaces in Building C, Council Member Rose, which is something we had not been able to ascertain before, but they will be able to increase the number in Building C. Um, in another question that was raised during the review process were um, whether we would be working uh, we're certainly committed to local uh, hiring and women and minority business uh, industries. Uh, and as HBD requires a uh, prevailing wage, uh, the client has been in touch with 32BJ, the Service Employees International, uh, particularly Kyle Bragg, who's the secretary, to discuss permanent jobs that would be union, union jobs. Uh, he hasn't gotten to... Uh, a, finished his construction budget, so he's working on that, and we'll continue discussing union jobs with the building trades. Um, the uh, affordability uh, issues, I would rather defer to my uh, colleague, uh, Ron Schulman, to discuss uh, what they've been in discussion with HPD regarding for affordability. On sustainability issues, um, Nellie Manelli could go into more detail if you'd like, but the building will have an independent generator in the event of uh, 
we hope no more floods, but in the event of a terrible storm and flooding, uh, there will be an, uh, an emergency generator. The buildings are by law required to be built above the flood hazard elevation, um, and they will be. Uh, they're exploring, looking, uh, exploring uh, whether solar panels, the viability of solar panels from a financial viewpoint, um, whether there's um, uh, NYSERDA money or some other program to help with the installation of, of uh, other sustainability fe features. Um, so they're working hard at that right now, uh, as I understand it. Um, and I think that covered all the issues other than affordability, which I'd like to defer to um, Ms. Mr. Shulman. Are there questions about the project overall? Oh, you'll come back. With we'll ask after he's. Good morning. My name is Ron Schulman, um, <clears throat> Best Development Group, and I represent uh, Pier 21 on the affordability. Uh, we passed around <clears throat> a one-page handout to show the difference between option one and option two under mandatory inclusionary housing. Option one, of course, is 25 percent at 60. Option two is 30 percent at 80 on average. Um, we understand, um, Mr. Chair and uh, Council Member Rose, that there was a discussion about affordability at the lowest tier, 40 percent which we're calling 37% of AMI, um, actually could accomplish that in both options, if that's the desire. Um, it's required under option one, and option two, we could um, skew the rents down to average out at 80, so we could have some at 37%, some at 80, some at above 80, um, play around with the AMI mix, but you could accomplish both affordability, deep rent skewed um, target, targeted units uh, if so desired under either option. Uh, the sponsor would like to keep both of these options open for the project. Um, and, you know, the affordability, of course, would be uh, larger under option two. It's 30% of the units, 30% of the square footage. Option one is 25%. We'd be happy to answer any questions, but we just wanted to give you that look of the difference between the option one and option two. Um, we've also met with HPD about uh, uh, the financing of the project. Uh, it's not committed to be financed with HPD or HDC, but we did have a very uh, uh, good conversation about the project, and it could possibly uh, be financed there, but that decision has not yet been made. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so on the handout you gave uh, on option one, so option one mandates a 10 percent uh, average, 10 uh, percent of units be at around 40 percent of AMI, so Correct. it's not really reflected here. So can you just speak to that? So I see 30 percent, 37 percent AMI at 3 percent, but in the MIH option one, uh, which we passed in this uh, council, it mandates 10 percent of the units to be at around 40 percent AMI. So I don't know if this is a typo or... 10 percent of the total in the project or 10 percent mm -hmm. of the MIH? Uh, yeah. And that's a typo. So 10 percent of the project would be, um, it would be, th it would be three, 37 or 39, depending on how large the project is, because it's 371 to 396. So you're aware of that? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and, all right, so let's go through, so just go through your, your averages again on both buildings. So. <clears throat> option one would be 25% uh, of the units. We're using the 396 was in the EAS, uh, the application at 371 total for all three buildings. If you took 25% of the 396, you'll come up with 99 units of MIH under option one. And under option two, you would have 30% of the units, which is 119, just shy of 120 units. Um, so it'd be 40 units. Uh, well, actually, go back to option one. Option one would have um, 30, 37 units at, at, at the 37 percent and um, 62 units at 57 and then under option two you would have 39, 30, 40 unit, rounded to 40 units at 37 and then we would mix it between the 80s and the 20s um, which would be 70 units distributed between the other two bands. Okay. And this area was, uh, and I'll let Councilmember Rose sort of go through that a little bit more through the affordability, but the committee likes option one here. So I know we have not selected an MIH option. Uh, can you just go into a little further so you're in discussions with HPD now? 
We met with HPD uh, about a week or two ago. We had a good discussion. We presented the project. Um, we talked about the financing. We did not commit to the financing, and they didn't uh, you know, return the commitment back, but we had a very good discussion about how the project would be financed if it is financed by HPD and HD. So are you looking at any programs, ELLA or any other? Uh, it program? would probably be would probably be a, an M squared project. Um, it, it would not be an ELLA. It's not an all tax credit deal. So probably M squared. Um, and can you go through resiliency again? So you spoke of putting the generator up on the roof, which is standard now, I mean, at least in waterfront communities. Um, can you go through other waterproofing uh, measures that you're putting in place uh, for these buildings. And this area, I would assume, was hit by Sandy, correct? Okay. Uh, it's, uh, like, yeah, yeah. Good morning. My name is Nelly Manella. I'm from the Jerry Caliendo Architects. Uh, we will be required to have the, the below the flood level is only the lobbies, the elevators, the stairs to get to above the flood level, all of that will be required to be either dry or wet flood proofing, and we will look into doing that. Um, other than that, I know we have uh, a requirement for an emergency generator above 125, which one of the buildings from the ground will be more than that. So we have a requirement to do that. And have you thought of flood proofing gates or no? Uh, we haven't discussed flood proofing gates, but it is a, uh, we could discuss that with the client. Yeah, I think uh, it should can. be something you certainly look at and get back to us on. I'm going to go to Councilmember Rose, but just want to reemphasize on the affordability. Option one is what we are interested in in the committee. Uh, Councilmember Rose. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I want to, uh, to say also that um, there needs to be further conversation about um, the MIH and, and the options. Um, because I'm, I'm concerned about how would the application of MIH option one or MIH option two affect the feasibility of this project? I, I don't know if it's, the feasibility it could go either way. It, it's just a different way of financing it. So 25% at 60 is one way where th likely there would be a sale of tax credits because those 60% of units are, generate tax credits. The 30% averaging at 80 might not be a tax credit um, purchaser because you might not have enough um, units in a lower income tier to sell tax credits. It's just a different way to finance the project. They're both possible ways of financing the project, and one is just a different way from another. Um, I, I can't say that one is better or one is worse. It's just different ways of financing the projects. And um, were there conversations with um, HPD about lower affordability? We discussed the affordability, um, I would say, in general, and we didn't get into uh, a long discussion about how low. We just talked about what levels we were thinking and talking about the different options. They, they didn't ask us to go any lower, right? We did mention the 40% that was your desire, and we said we could accomplish it with either one or option two. Yeah. So are we looking at further discussion on option one? Good morning, Chris Vecchiarelli. Um, absolutely. Um, the reason, um, as you know, when we first presented the project, we presented it with three options. Um, uh, understanding that the workforce housing option was not a desirable option, um, we eliminated that. Uh, the reason that I am particularly requesting having both options still in play is to have some flexibility with the financing of the project as Tehran just alluded to, di di just different ways to finance the project mm -hmm. um, where both can achieve, you know, a band of the 40% AMI that, um, that you are looking for. Um, and from my point of view, having that flexibility um, just makes uh, me more comfortable with, uh, you know, bringing the, bringing the project uh, to fruition. And nothing's been um, decided yet? Nothing has been finalized as finalized. of yet, no. Okay. Um, in terms of the parking, um, you know, the plan, 
addresses that there will be one space per unit in Building A. So um, can you just clarify your commitment to use the stackers in Building B and C for one-to-one -one ratio parking? Um, and, and what is the time frame for the building of, of buildings A and B? In terms of commitment, the client has not committed to one-to-one -to -one parking. I want to be clear. I don't want to be disingenuous here. Uh, there isn't space in the project for one-to-one -one parking. The, par the project was designed um, in accordance with the zoning regulations and, and yet giving more than the zoning was going to require. Um, and there's a total of... Um, the total number of spaces is 346 if you include commercial, uh, the permitted parking uh, that's on the street and the required parking uh, that's high, the amount of parking we're attributing to required parking, but it's actually more than is required. There is not room for one-to-one -one parking only for residential on this project. It was designed without that in mind the height limitations, the height ele uh, ele maximum height of the building was uh, planned with only the parking at the elevation of the ground. Uh, if we had planned, if they had been planning a one-to-one -one parking for the residential plus the required, there might well have been a different building design, maybe a different request on height. So there's not as much there's not just ultimate flexibility to provide the one-on-one. -on -one. The place where they could provide the stackers is in Building C. They, between our last discussion and now, they actually explored the floor-to-ceiling height uh, in Building B. And the ground floor where the parking is uh, doesn't allow for park space, uh, 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 stackers, but there is enough room in Building C to provide additional stackers. So. Um, but not in Building B. Now, I understand now not that they actually measured it, and it's not feasible to put stackers in Building B. They could put smaller spaces, like for compact cars, but not stackers. It requires too high a floor-to-ceiling height. So if there's a need for additional parking, that will not happen until the very last building is, is finished. Building C. But as you said, as you pointed out, Building 1 has... 100% parking, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that all the units in that building are going to be renting all of those spaces. They might. And if they do, that would certainly be indicative that they would want to add more parking in the later phase. So I could be a resident in Building B and not have a space. That's theoretically possible. We would have to deal with that um, and, and see where the parking can go. So Otherwise. what's the time frame in terms of, of building, you know, um, buildings B and C? The EAS gave a two-year, uh, a little over two-year time frame from build, the construction of building one to the building the, C. Uh, two years between each building no, no, no. being built? Total. Okay. No, two years in total. And um, again, as, as um, we had requested um, to do the project in phases, there's also the possibility that they can, you know, multiple buildings can be built at the same time. Um, the entire project can be built at the same time. So again, our request to build phases was just our request, request thinking that it's a, it, it may be a better way to build out the site, being that it's a large site. Um, however, that doesn't need to be the case. So to to your um, question earlier about um, will is there a possibility of somebody in building B not having a spot? Um, should um, we have tremendous success with phase one or building A, um, there could be a possibility that building B and C get built at the same time simultaneously, and that could accommodate then probably you know a very close, not not a one for one, but a very close um, one for one parking uh, ratio. And so, um, in the one-to-one -one ratio, uh, was that was the I heard in the presentation that in the affordable um, uh, percentages that there's a different ratio yes. of parking. Yes. Uh, under the zoning resolution, affordable parking has a lower a lower uh, parking ratio than market rate units do. So. 
where are you compensating for these fewer parking spaces? No, what we're doing is we are, at the moment, uh, the, the market rate units, we're only, um, we're required to supply 70% um, parking for the market rate units. For the affordable units, the ratio is 55%. We are achieving 70% at the site as it's currently designed. So at the moment, we are already providing more parking than the zoning requires. You know I have a problem with this parking, right? We do understand that there's, as I said, there's very, there are very limited ways that we can uh, expand the amount of parking only to a certain extent um, based on the design of the project. And it's, uh, I'm happy to discuss it with you uh, outside of the hearing. And how much, um, how many parking spaces are you looking at around the, the complex? Since there are 16. You're talking about street parking. The street, street parking on the private street is 16, and that's included in the 70%, what we've achieved as a little over 70% parking, 71%. So you're building that into the 70%? Yes. It's 16 spaces. That street is, 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 being, a, is on our property. It's a private that's, street. That's mm -hmm. on the um, visual corridor of the property. So you're, um, so you're not counting parking on Edgewater? No, we no. are not. No. Absolutely not. This is all on-site parking. Uh, I imagine that we could swap. Uh, I'd have to look into swapping the 16 that are on, on the street uh, to make them in some way dedicated for the commercial use and have those 16 spaces inside the parking garage as residential spaces, we could look into whether, from the zoning perspective, we're allowed to do that. I don't know if we are. So where are you looking at the commercial parking at? They're in the garage. In the garage yes. also. Correct. Okay. Um, so if we can, if we can uh, add residential park, t take some of the garage spaces that are, that are now earmarked for commercial and allow them to be counted on the outside on the street because it's a pri it is private property and it could be uh, monitored, uh, then uh, I'll see if we can do that. I don't know if the zoning will allow us to do that. And how many commercial spaces? 81. 81. Um, are the towers going to be visible from upland communities? There are uh, places where the towers will be visible but very minimally in the handout that we shared with you. Uh, there is a perception of building heights. The building A, the first building, uh, building on the left, will be visible um, behind the power station tower uh, smokestack, but the smokestack itself blocks a good portion of that. Uh, and how many stories are we talking visibility? It's I, I, about two, three stories. Uh, behind Pouch Terminal, from very few vantage points, you might see one story above the roof of Pouch. And behind the uh, tower, I don't know the number that's visible behind the tower. It's set back from the street considerably, and it, you'd only have to be, you'd be standing in the middle of Lynnhurst to be able to see it. It's not visible from the streets that are parallel to Bay Street. When you're on the street, the, your, your perspective isn't uh, adequate to, to, to look over the other buildings that are between you and, and the project. Um, and, and with the um, resiliency efforts, um, what are you doing to ensure the flood flood resiliency? Well, number one, the building is being built above the flood hazard level, which is a brand new flood hazard level. You know that actually caused some issues with our environmental study because the flood hazard levels have changed. So the base flood elevation that you build from has been raised. So according to the current science, the building, um, no residential portion of the building will be in the flood hazard uh, level. The ground floor where the flood would occur is uh, occupied by cars, not by uh, commercial or residential space, and that's com compliant with the, lo the, the most uh, recent 
iteration of the flood hazard maps. So that's the number one uh, facility uh, to protect the buildings and the people from, from the risk of a flood. Along the esplanade, what are you doing to, are you doing any measures to, to ensure resilience? Uh, are you building any kind of wall? No, or we're not, we're not building a the... flood barrier there. And my understanding is that, that Parks Department does not want a flood barrier, uh, but has a, uh, the shoreline is, is de designed in a way that water washes in and out. Uh, the, the esplanade itself, the distance between the shoreline and the building is another measure that actually protects the buildings from, because they're set back from the waterfront, uh, protects the buildings from, from flood hazards. And there was a question about the waterfront being constructed in phases. Um, Mr. Vecchiarelli um, mentioned that it's possible that maybe all three buildings might be worked on at the same time. It's a possibility. I mean, you know, it, I, it's, we're not making a commitment to that. Um, obviously, the market has a lot to do with dictating that. The, the, finance, the financing of the projects have a lot to do with that. But that is, that is a possibility at the end of the day. And if you do that, does that then change um, how the Esplanade will be um, constructed? Sure. Because Absol right now... Absolutely. If, if all three buildings are, are being built simultaneously, again, which I, I don't anticipate happening, but if they were to be built simultaneously, the short public walkway would also be built at the same time. There's a practical matter. The pouch terminal is immediately behind building B's and B and C. So there's no place to put, for example, a crane or a tractor behind uh, upland from B and C. So they need to use the space either to the east, uh, sorry, to the south or to the north or to the, towards the water in order to build the building. Mm -hmm. You don't want that kind of heavy equipment on a brand new esplanade. It'll ruin the esplanade. So it, it's only practical to, to build the building first and then fix the esplanade, make the esplanade beautiful after you've finished having all that heavy construction equipment on it. The same thing, the, the smaller building, building C, um, there is room uh, between building B and C for equipment and the area right in front is not wide enough for construction equipment. So building C, which is the shortest and probably would end up being built with building B, when they're finished, then they'll be able to complete the esplanade. But it makes no sense to build the esplanade out, have it be beautiful, and then have it be ripped up by construction vehicles. So what's the time frame, do you think, that, um, you know, for accessibility to the esplanade? The entire esplanade. When building C is complete, the entire esplanade would be accessible. Or well, sometimes shortly thereafter, a after they finish, and then they fix the esplanade. And so the time frame again for all three buildings. The to EAS be reported a two-year time frame for building all three buildings, um, and so sometime after that, shortly after that, would be the completion of the esplanade. And my last question is, and I thank the committee's indulgence, um, that um, will the jobs be local hiring, good paying, um, with attention being paid to MWBE contractors? Yes, in fact, we'd very much like to work with Councilman's office and uh, the community board to uh, provide for local hiring and WMBE businesses uh, as part of the uh, project mission not only for construction jobs and then during uh, full, full employment hire, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Mr. Vecchiarelli is already in discussion with BJ. Um, 32 BJ. 32, 32. And those conversations are going to continue? Yes, they are. Absolutely. Um, and for, you know, retail jobs like the, the shopkeepers and so on, uh, definitely looking to have local hire, and we'd love to work with your office on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Councilmember Wills for a question. Good afternoon. Uh, could you just give me a, a brief history of your development track record, how, how much you've built, how long you've been building? Sure. Um, I've been uh, in this business for 17 years. Um, I actually started my business on Staten Island, uh, building single-family and two-family homes. Um, 
we primarily now focus on mid-rise uh, multifamily apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, typically build for a long-term hold and investment um, and uh, you know, have a considerable sizable portfolio at the moment. So if I was to ask you about uh, M M MWBE contractors, both construction and post hiring for MWBE as single individuals or minority hiring or community preference, you already have a track record that you can speak to? Absolutely. So then what are your uh, aspirational goals and what are the goals you've already met in some of your other projects? Well, in, some, in some of the other projects, um, I think we try to meet a 7% uh, WBE and, uh, and I think a 10 to 12%, uh, maybe even 15% uh, MBE. Um, uh, Local hire. You said seven percent. Seven percent, yes, of MBE. MWBE or WBE. Uh, w, excuse me. W. w. What about minorities? Uh, Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Yes. And that's aspirational. Or have those goals actually been met? Um, those goals have. If they haven't been met, they've been very close. Okay. Um, when you spoke to the phases, uh, I know that you said that uh, trying to complete the work at one time is something that you would try to, you, you're not taking it out, but you're not committing it to it because of logistical issues, especially with the council member wanting the uh, promenade to be accessible. Uh, but you also, you spoke about logistics to that, but is financing one of the pieces that would say we would build, I mean, that would make sense, Th That's right? the main reason. It has, the the, the okay. main reason of, of, of requesting um, a phase development is, mm -hmm. is, is the market and the financeability of the project. That, that's the financeability of the project, not the esplanade. The esplanade no, 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 is I understand. definitely no, going to be I'm built. I'm speaking There's to the project, hundred. but her, her mm. desire is to have the, the, I'm speaking to the project. I understand yes. the construction portion. I wanted to mention something about the financing of the project, um, not to contradict my colleague. Um, one of the options that he mentioned depends on tax credits being mm -hmm. viable. And um, with the current uh, <clears throat> temperament in Washington, um, the future of tax credits is a bit in the air, I, as I understand. Low income tax. Low income tax okay. credit, which is part of, part of what might be in in involved here. And tax credits generally, uh, we don't know. So the, the, the desire would be to be able to come up with a financing package that could address the whole the whole project at once and have uh, lenders involved, private lenders as well as whatever uh, HPD sources there are, be able to finance the whole project at once. Um, we're not certain that's going to happen, so that's why we were looking for different, having some flexibility on the options going forward with a commitment to 40 percent AMI, but with flexibility as to which option was going to be used, because we don't know what the. Um, are you soft pedaling the 40 percent? I'm not soft pedaling. I'm committed. Okay, to I'm the, just uh, okay. You're no, committing. I'm saying in both option one and two, 40 percent is there, and right. we're committed to that. Okay, it's whether we can do, you know, whether it's the 57. You can go no, uh, option one and two, as I understand the difference, and uh, Mr. Schulman will address it. One has 57 percent AMI and and the 37 percent AMI, and the second one has up to 120 percent to 37 percent AMI. That, that's all I'm talking about, is the difference between having options one and two prevail on the property. Okay, so you're just one. clarifying to make sure there was no promise to... Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes. I, all right, I appreciate that's it. That's my, my, my job in part is to make sure my clients don't overpromise. So Understood. I wanted to make sure that was the case. Always underpromise, overdeliver. Oh, that's the best. Understood. Right? Every, people are happy then. The, um, with the affordable units in the buildings, how are those going to be placed if you're doing phases? In are each building, at, yeah. the, the percentage of affordability in each building will be scattered through the building as required with no discrimination uh, based on, on the income level of the tenant. So then the uh, affordability, un affordable units will be placed in each building with, with, with the equity. Yeah. So it won't be something with the parking that she has a concern over, parking in the, right. the last building be put in. It would be spread across. Spread even. It, Proportional to each building's number of units will be the percentage of affordable units. It would be go building by building. All right. Thank you very much for any of my questions. All righty. Thank you.
Any other questions from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, we now move on to the next panel. Thank you. And, and just on the uh, jobs and local hiring and MWBE, uh, establishing a reporting mechanism with Councilmember Rose uh, before it reaches the Land Use Committee would be important to this committee. Excellent. Well. We'd be happy to do Thank it. you. All righty. We are now going to move on to Brian Brown from 32BJ. We'll put on a clock, two minute, uh, Sergeant at Arms, two minutes on the clock. Good morning, council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Bryant Brown, and I am here speaking on behalf of my union, SEIU 32BJ. We represent 600 members who live in Staten Island Community District 1, the district where Pier 21 Development is proposing to develop 125 Edgewater. I am testifying today to urge you to consider how important it is that Pier 21 Development commit to creating high quality jobs at 125 Edgewater. Uh, developments that pay building service workers the industry standard prevailing wage and benefits package allows workers to stay in the city and support their families. These jobs at the building will affect the well-being of the community for years to come. Staten Island Community Board 1, I would like to reemphasize, recognized the need for these kinds of good jobs and their recommendations regarding this project. It is especially important that Pier 21 development provides both affordable housing and high-quality building service jobs at 125 Edgewater because this development will serve as a model for the developments that will follow the planned rezoning of the Bay Street Corridor. The Council can help ensure that 125 Edgewater sets a strong precedent for responsible development in Staten Island. This is why 32BJ is calling on you to disprove this project unless, VCAP, unless Pier 21 Development commits to providing good building service jobs that pay the prevailing wage for local residents. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public? So, Mr. Brown, the, wait, before you leave, because you've, you've been here, um, you are in negotiations with, right? And do you have a, a hard line or a hard deadline on when the negotiations? I mean, the chair already spoke to before it goes to land use. So what is your timeline with the negotiations that you're working with now? Mm, I would have to follow up with my colleagues as far as a specific timeline, but mm. I would like to confirm that, yes, we have been in conversations. We look forward to them continuing. Um, we still haven't come to an agreement or a commitment um, and so as far as timeline goes, I would have to get back with you. All right. Well, we have all um, respect and uh, what's the name for Cal Bragg, so we understand that it'll work out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge we are joined by PS166, I believe, from Queens. Hello. Sorry. I hope we didn't put you to sleep. Uh, uh, and they are from Council Member Van Bramer's district, and they're from uh, Astoria, Queens. I know zoning could be complex, but you can become zoning gurus by sticking around here a little longer. All righty. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? All right. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items number 654 and 655, and we are laying this app, uh, we're laying over this application until our next meeting. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Chair Greenfield, and we will continue to roll call in the subcommittee. Council, call the roll. Councilmember Wells. Aye. Final vote or vote stands at five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. All righty. We will now move on to land use items number 651 and 652, 1350 Bedford Avenue rezoning. This application includes a rezoning action that would establish an R7D district instead of the existing R6A district and a zoning text amendment to apply to mandatory and inclusionary housing area on the property. These actions would facilitate the development of a 93-unit affordable housing development reserved for families making between 40 and 130 percent of the area median income. The development would be located on the site 
as an existing 78 unit section 8 building with tenant incomes ranging from 32,000 to 60,000. The new development would be located on the parking lot of the existing building. This application is located in Councilmember Cumbo's district. I will now open the public hearing on land use items number 651 and 652 and go to Councilmember Cumbo if she wishes to give a statement quickly. And then we will move on to the first channel, Charles Ruggs, Bedford something, I messed it up, oh, Bedford Arms, Michael Weiss, Bedford Arms, John Shaminti, the architect for the project. All right, she's not gonna give a statement. Okay, you may begin. All right, and you'll just hit uh, light your mic. You'll press the button on your mic and light it up, and you may begin. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Stuart Beckerman from the Law Office of Slater and Beckerman. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair um, uh, uh, Richards and uh, Council Members. Um, with me uh, uh, are uh, Michael Weiss, who's from Bedford Arms, which is the owner and developer of the property. They've owned the property for 40 years, and, uh, uh, and we can talk a little bit about what they do later. Um, and also here is Charles Brass, our housing, uh, affordable housing consultant, uh, and John Cimenti, the architect. Um, so, the, uh, uh, so just briefly, the development site itself, which is also the rezoning site, is approximately 35,000 square feet with uh, frontages on Dean Street, Bedford Avenue, and Pacific Street. Currently, the site is improved with a six-story, uh, 74 and a half foot high Section 8 building with 78 apartments uh, with approximately 68,000 square feet of floor area and an existing 35 space uh, accessory parking lot. The, um, we're here seeking uh, council, uh, seeking your recommendation for the city council to approve the following two actions. One is a, uh, uh, an application to rezone the development site uh, from an R6A district to an R7D district, and the uh, boundaries of the zoning lot are the full extent of the rezoning area. And we're also seeking an amendment to the text of the zoning resolution to designate this site a, a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Uh, just briefly, the community board voted uh, uh, no negative votes uh, in support of this uh, application with no conditions, and the borough president recommended approval, um, and we can discuss a little bit about what they wanted, which we are generally in, in compliance with. Uh, so here, just for your reference, is the, uh, the, the zoning map. So you'll see that currently uh, our site is uh, R6A, and we're gonna create an R7D uh, over our property. Uh, and here's the, uh, the new, on the upper right, is the uh, new uh, MIH uh, area over our site. So the project itself, um, what we're proposing to construct over the existing parking lot is a, a nine-story, uh, 89 and a half uh, foot high, 100% affordable uh, uh, housing uh, uh, apartment building with uh, 80,000 square feet of floor area and 94 dwelling units. Um, it says here 23 spaces that we're going to be providing are required. Actually, only 21 spaces are required uh, and because, because uh, uh, most of the units on the project are going to meet the definition of income restricted which, and because we're in a transit zone uh, under the new zoning regulations that uh, the council adopted last year under ZQA, uh, only 21 required spaces are provided, are required rather, and we're going to provide two additional uh, spaces. Um, here is the, uh, the unit breakdown and the AMI breakdown. Uh, we are proposing uh, to build 59 one-bedrooms, uh, 25 two-bedrooms, nine three-bedrooms, and one supers unit, a total of 90, uh, three, 94 units. Uh, the AMI breakdown is as follows. Uh, 10 units are going to be at 37% AMI, 14 units at 57% AMI, 28 units at 80% AMI, and 41 units at 130% AMI. Um, so those 41 units are what generates the requirement for parking. Under ZQA, a total of uh, 21 spaces is required, uh, which explains uh, that we're also going to have two additional spaces that are not required. Uh, even though this is not before the City Council, it is important to note that we 
uh, also have an application pending at the uh, Board of Stands and Appeals. This is a new special permit that was uh, created as part of ZQA last year, and we're actually the first applicant uh, under this section. Uh, if our existing uh, Section 8 building were to be constructed today under ZQA, because we're in a transit zone and all the units are under 80% AMI, actually I think they're like 50% AMI, um, we, uh, no parking would be required. So because we're building over the, uh, the parking lot and we're, gonna, we're asking for a waiver to eliminate uh, the existing 35 required parking spaces that were required when we uh, created our Section 8 building in 1980. At that time, uh, I think it was 50% parking that was required uh, and uh, we are only, so we are seeking uh, permission to waive. Um, and you know, the parking space, the parking lot has been significantly underutilized, so we have a strong case for that. Um, so here is the, um, this is the site plan, the existing building, so you'll see uh, the parking lot is quite significant, it's on Pacific Street, and the building itself is kind of L irregularly L-shaped and it fronts on Bedford and and Dean Street. Uh, here are some photos of the site. Here's the existing Section 8 building. Um, and uh, that is on Pacific Street. That shows you the development site. That's the parking lot that we are going to build on. Another view of the parking lot. Um, and, uh, and finally, just it's worth noting that across the street to the right across Pacific Street is the Bedford Atlantic uh, a men's shelter. Uh, so it, you know, we're going to definitely be improving this location with the construction of, uh, actually this is the site plan, and this is what, uh, this is a rendering of the proposed building. Um, so I think uh, at this point I think what I'll do is I'll entertain any questions um, that uh, the uh, council members might have. Thank you uh, for your testimony. I uh, wanted to know if what, was, what would be the feasibility of squeezing in a few more units at the 37 um, and 57% 57, 57 AMI? Is there a possibility of squeezing in a few more units there? Um, I'll, I think I'll let Mr. Bress address that, but I'll just point out that you mean converting some of the units that we have at higher AMI, AMIs and turning them into 37%. Um, I, that really goes to the economics of, of, of the building. Um, and I just want to just make one other point that I don't think I, I emphasized enough, and that is that uh, Bedford Arms is part of the Engel Group, which uh, owns and, um, and operates at the, presently about 3,500 uh, affordable housing units in New York and New Jersey. This is what they're committed to doing. Uh, you know, I believe in a couple of weeks when you vote on this, you're also going to be voting on the Article 11 application. We are ready to hit the ground uh, to build this building. It's not just going to sit empty. We're, we're, and so the, the economics, and just to answer your question, uh, you know, the economics have been very carefully studied. These are experienced developers of this type of housing. And, and one other thing, I'm sorry, I just want to make one other important point. And that is once this is granted and once the special permit is approved, and we've now reduced the number of parking spaces on the lot from 35 to 23. What we will be doing is um, uh, ma you know, mandating that these units will be permanently affordable because the parking, obviously the num amount of parking is linked to the uh, number of uh, units that are not income restricted. So I just wanted to point that out. So. Um, I'll let Mr. Brass uh, answer that question. So, so there are already, as, as uh, Stuart pointed out, 78 uh, very low income, 78 very low income units next door in the Section 8 project that are, are essentially going to be uh, permanently, permanently affordable. So what we're seeking to do here is uh, to bring a mixed uh, income uh, 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 development uh, into the immediate area where there are 78 very low income units next door and a homeless uh, shelter, uh, men's shelter across the, across the street. So uh, with regard to the economics of this project, we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, I heard the discussion about tax credits uh, last year. 
in the last uh, 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 presentation, we're not seeking any uh, federal uh, tax credits here. The, all of the equity uh, for the project is going to be provided by, uh, by the owners of Bedford Arms. So, and, and uh, you know, we're seeking subsidies from, <coughs> excuse me, from HDC and HPD to develop the income mix uh, that we're, uh, we're proposing here, which actually far exceeds uh, the require already far exceeds the requirements of mandatory in inclusionary uh, in that we have, uh, you know, 55 percent of the units below, of these new units below 80 percent of, of, of AMI instead of uh, 30 percent, so. All right. So I just uh, would uh, caution you just to keep an open mind there, and, and obviously I'm happy to hear you're seeking subsidy from HPD. Um, I'm going to go to Councilmember Combo, but we would love to see a little bit, you know, to squeeze a few more units out um, under uh, 60. So we'll go to Councilmember Combo. Thank you. Wanted to hear more about the adjacent building, the Section 8. Wanted to find out what was the history of that, how that project came to be, um, and what is the viability in the future of that project moving forward. The adjacent lot that um, is the Section 8 housing. Uh, good morning. Good morning. And let me respond to that. I'm Michael Weiss. I'm with Bedford Arms. Uh, my family and partners own the adjacent building. Um, we built that building um, in response to a request for proposals uh, from HPD in 1981. It was uh, an abandoned uh, private hospital. Prior to that, it was a hotel. Um, when we opened our doors in 1981, it was 78 uh, Section 8 units, low-income Section 8 units. Uh, we have renewed our HAP contracts, which run, depending on what the government sees fit, generally uh, 20 years. We just recently, within the last three years, uh, renewed our HAP contracts, so we have another 15 years. We couldn't go any further than the f uh, 20 years because the federal government doesn't have that uh, vehicle. It is our intention uh, to keep that building at Section 8. We have a presence in Brooklyn just to give you an mm -hmm. idea of our family, um, for 60 years we've been, uh, the family's been building and has buildings, other Section 8 units in Bed-Stuy um, on Howard Avenue outside of your district, Councilwoman. And uh, they remain to this day after 30 years um, Section 8 and will remain Section 8. We have a, a mission, uh, although we're profit motivated, um, as long as it's economically feasible, uh, it's our intention and my family's intention and partners to keep it Section 8. I hope that addresses your question. What is the average annual income of the individuals living in the adjacent building? Well, do you know? Well, well they can exceed 50 percent of AMI. And uh, I, I, to be, I, I don't know the exact incomes here, but I, I've looked at a lot of Section 8 projects. And it's typically people making, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, 40 percent of the area median income. The average is typically around 25 to 30 percent of AMI in a, in a typical Section 8 project. And there's no reason to think this would be any different th th than, than that. And, count, count and we can problem. provide that to your offices. We I would will appreciate provide. that. Let me ask you another question. Uh, moving forward, the the project that is presented before us, the borough president addressed this issue. I've also brought it up in terms of MWBE and local hiring. That's a very important aspect of this particular project and to the 35th Council District. Can you speak to uh, your MWBE and local hiring plan for this project specifically? Um, yes, uh, on, on May 26th, um, we submitted a letter to your offices um, telling you that it is our intention um, to abide by and try and ascertain the goals, although they're not exactly known yet, to use uh, uh, minority-based and women-based uh, enterprises. Um, if I might I digress uh, for a moment, when we did our Section 8 buildings, not only in uh, the fine city of New York, but in New Jersey, we always made sure that we uh, 
tried to ascertain um, and reach the goals um, for minority-based and women-based contracting, and we will do the same here. I want us to do, on this particular project, uh, I want us to do more than try. I really want, in this project, for us to reach that 30% uh, uh, goal that the City of New York is trying to achieve by 2021. I'd like to see it done now so that we can be at the forefront of making sure that MWBEs um, and local hiring are a major part of this project because that adds to the economic growth of our community. Can you talk about uh, reaching that commitment uh, versus the trying to reach that commitment? We have to reach that commitment. Our tries have fallen short um, with MWBEs being less than 4% of all city contracts with subsidies that are actually awarded. So we want to move from the try to established goals. I agree with you. I um, can only talk in terms of uh, we plan to do it, we have done it, and we, we plan to work with your offices uh, and seek qualified people who are financially stable and make sure that we have one of the finest projects utilizing uh, the goals of the city. Yes. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, wanted to discuss with you uh, the borough president's recommendations as well as mine uh, that there be a housing lottery partner that makes sure that local area residents um, are provided with all of the information necessary to um, qualify for the housing lottery for this because what we see is that often local communities are not given that opportunity to have access to the lottery system. What is your plan in order to provide uh, a housing lottery component that is accessible to the, com to the community and having an outreach partner to do that? Well, uh, well, we'll be happy to work with your office and the community board to identify someone to you know, affirmatively market to residents uh, in, in the community. Uh, uh, you know, pursuant to the preferences that HPD and, and HDC have in their marketing plans to meet the 50 percent, at least the 50 percent set aside for community board residents in the, in the neighborhood. So. Have you worked with a partner previously? We, we intend to be in Article 11, and we are going to partner with New York City Housing Partnership. We, we worked with them in our past on some of our other buildings. Um, and we intend to uh, uh, f use the facilities of HPD and um, market through them. And I, uh, when I told them we had 94 units in, in, the, in the preliminary discussions, they said, we'll have 80,000 applicants. So not only do we intend to come to you and ask anybody you direct us to who is qualified, we are going to work with the New York City Housing Partnership. I, I'm sure you all are familiar with them and their track record. Very admirable. I have a number of uh, community-based housing development not-for-profits that could service this particular program. Are you open and committed to working with a housing partner, not-for-profit, to make sure that the lottery not only reaches 80,000 people, but most importantly, reaches individuals in the immediate community, even if it's those individuals living right next door in your uh, Section 8 housing, which I applaud your efforts to renew that particular program and maintain the Section 8 uh, portion of that particular project. Want to get a commitment that we can work together on a, com uh, a community-based not-for-profit partner to make sure that the lottery is geared and marketed to the immediate community. Um, you have my commitment that I'll work with your offices to try and satisfy your needs and, and the needs of the community. Certainly. And just wanted to, uh, the community board approved uh, this particular project by 24 approved. There were two abstentions. One. I thought there was only one. Yeah. One or two. I, I'm I've not sure. The, um, I can't. I think it was. I know it was 24. Four. I'm not sure how many abstained. Okay. But uh, nobody voted no, so that's uh, right. That's a record, probably. So. <laughs> 
Um, and another point that uh, the borough president and I both brought up um, was that HPD modify affordable housing lottery community preference to be inclusive of the school zone attended by a child of a household residing at a city funded or operated homeless shelter. Can you talk to us about that in terms of the lottery process? Good morning, my name is Jordan Press. I'm executive director for planning and development in HPD's government affairs unit. Um, currently, we need to be very careful about um, making any changes at all to the way that we handle our community preference uh, set aside. Um, we have a standard set aside, which is 50% of the units are set aside to members of the community board where the project is located. Um, and at this time, we do not deviate from that in nearly any circumstance. It's certainly something to look into moving forward to make sure that we do that, as well as an issue that we brought up in regards to the rent burden status um, into account into affordable housing eligibility. Because the rent burden status, um, it knocks a lot of individuals out of the process. We wanna see moving forward that those individuals that um, are most challenged are given an opportunity to qualify for affordable housing. Yeah, we really appreciate your thinking on, on that, both rent burden fam families and families living in the shelter. Well, we hope your appreciation turns into action um, and would like to see that moving forward. I don't have any further questions. I'll turn it back over to the chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any of my colleagues? Okay. Councilmember Greenfield. I actually have a question for my friends at HPD as they voluntarily decided to jump up there. Jordan, here's my question for you. Uh, the 50% preference, are you always able to hit that preference or do you have times when you're unable to hit that 50% threshold and therefore you're taking folks from outside of the community? Um, prior to the launch of New York City Housing Connect, our online um, lottery system, which came online in 2013, I believe, we did have instances uh, every now and then of families that didn't, um, from the community board, that didn't make it. Ever since we went online, we have not had that problem at all. So you're hitting the 50%? Easily. Okay. And are, uh, what programs do you have in place or could you offer the council member in terms of helping folks uh, be prepared for that? We've heard from many folks who've had challenges. They, they get selected by the lottery, then for whatever reason they're not able to actually get the unit either due to credit issues or uh, proof of income issues or other issues. What can you offer uh, in terms of uh, either yourself or a nonprofit operator or even the developer to try to be helpful with that for those folks who do go through the system. Well, the council member, to her credit, uh, has um, uh, done quite a bit of partnering in preparation, uh, preparation for the lottery, whether it's uh, credit counseling. Um, I, I, I think she's been a, uh, a, a leader in helping the community understand um, what some of those factors are. Um, HPD would be happy to come out again and do, you know, if, if we need to do a, a resource fair or something like that to, to help uh, members of the community board understand what needs to be done. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your testimony today. And uh, just reiterating what Councilmember Cumbo said, importance of MWBE, local hiring, and also reporting mechanisms. So I would urge you to work with her on uh, reporting with the, perhaps the local organization of her choosing. Um, back to the affordability question on option one, uh, seeing if we can get some more units down at the 37 and the 57 uh, AMA, AMIs. Um, and that will be it. Okay. So Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing these things in writing. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this, testify on this issue? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 651 and 652. We are laying this application over to our next meeting, and we will now move on to the last hearing. Um,
in land use today. We have on, uh, in, on land use items number 653, uh, the 55-57 Spring Street tax amendment. The tax amendment would decrease the lot coverage limitations on two sites in the special Little Italy district. This would allow the two existing buildings to be enlarged to 100% lot coverage on the first floor, allowing for an expansion of existing commercial use. I will now open a public hearing on land use item number 653 and go to Council Member Chen for, for a statement if she so wishes, and then we will call the applicant. The applicant should, could make his way up. Dan e Eggers uh, from J Bam TRG LLC, Spring LLC. Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I would like to thank Chair Richards and member of the subcommittee for allowing me to speak at the start of this hearing. The application before you today concerns a tax amendment to modify the map of the special Little Lily District to allow for rear yard enlargement at 55 and 57 Spring Street. I have strong objections to this application and wish to share them with you today. Over the course of the last several months, I have heard from building residents and members of the larger community who have attended community board meetings or reach out to my office about this project. These buildings once housed many rent-protected apartments, affordable units that mix up the lifeblood of this neighborhood. In recent times and under multiple owners, many of these units have been taken out of regulation. Today, these buildings house more mockery tenants, new neighbors who are less familiar with the fight to protect the things that make Little Italy unique. The remaining rent-protected apartment still house people who help make Little Italy the desirable neighborhood it is today. In seeking to build support for this application, the owner cite that a majority of the market rate tenants are in favor, while ignoring or denigrating the opposition of rent-protected tenants. These longtime residents now fear retaliation for having voiced their concern about the unfair impact these proposed changes will have on their quality of life. In regard to this application, I am not convinced that this proposal is in the best interest of the tenants at 57, 55 to 57 Spring Street and strikes the right balance between public and private benefits. I do not share the view of the City Planning Commission that this tax amendment is appropriate. Therefore, the proposal does not have my support, and I urge this subcommittee to deny this application. Community Board 2 overwhelmingly rejected this proposal. I believe our borough president has her own serious concerns. The last time the provision of this special district will alter, New York City and Little Italy were very different places. I cannot support a piecemeal approach to addressing these provisions, which were put in place to protect our community and the character of this neighborhood. To the tenants of 55 and 57 Spring Street, fearing retaliation from their landlord, I'm here to give my unwavering support and urge you to contact my office about any attempt to intimidate or harass you into silence. In solidarity with these tenants who have voiced their legitimate objection about the proposed changes, I ask that my colleague heed their concerns by voting no on this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Chen. Good morning, Dan Eggers, land use attorney from Greenberg Charg, representing the applicant. And thank you, Councilmember Chin, for your comments. If, if I could respond, first off, regarding the um, deregulation of uh, rent-controlled and rent-stabilized units, there have been three in the almost two years that our client has owned the building. These were pursuant to high rent vacancy deregulation. They were properly deregulated, and we provided the uh, rent histories and other information to the community board when they raised these concerns. As for the um, harassment or intimidation of tenants, I am not aware of, of any such instances under the, the current ownership, and I have not been made aware of any um, with respect to uh, tenants being pressured into supporting this application. Um, 
my client uh, reached out to all occupants of these buildings. There are 27 uh, occupied units. 24 of the 27 units support the application, including all three rent-controlled uh, units. Um, should I should I proceed with a, a background um, introduction of the of the application? Sure. Okay. So as as Council Member Chin outlined before, this is an application for 5557 Spring Street. These buildings are on the north side of Spring Street between Mulberry and Lafayette Street. They are in Area A of the Special Little Italy District. Area A allows a maximum of 60% lot coverage on interior lots. Area A1, which is immediately adjacent to the uh, property on the east, allows full ground floor lot coverage for commercial uses. This application would move the boundary of Area A1 50 feet to the west to cover 55 and 57 Spring Street, which would allow the ground floor commercial uses to be extended to fully cover the property. This would be an enlargement of 1,750 square feet. The dimensions would be approximately 35 by 50 feet. And is this for existing commercial, or this is would be brand new commercial? Our, our client um, is in the process of renegotiating leases with the existing tenants. It's unclear at this time whether the expansion would be used by the existing tenants or by new retail uses, but we expect that the retail uses would be, if they're new, would be consistent with the type that's there now. And here you see the rear yard. The land use rationale is as follows. These are the only buildings on the block front that do not extend to their rear lot line. So, this in, so the enlargement would be in context with surrounding building form. And secondly, the uses in the buildings have been historically more in line with those of Area A1 than Area A. Area A has no requirement for ground floor commercial uses while Area A1 requires specific retail or restaurant uses listed in the zoning resolution on the ground floor. These buildings have traditionally had those uses, most recently a French bakery, a crepery, and a fr French cosmetic store, and now a Korean barbecue. These are specialty food stores. And when the Special Little Italy District was created in 1976, city planning issued a study saying that the distinction between Area A and Area A1 is that Area A1 had more specialty shops. And these, these have been specialty shops. As I said, the buildings were purchased by our client just under two years ago. The borough president and the city planning commission support the application. We tried to garner the support of the application from a local community group, the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors, and the community board. We met with the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors and had three hearings before the community board, the land use committee, and met twice with a subcommittee of the land use committee. We offered, which would be memorialized in a restrictive declaration, the following four community benefits. First, the ground floor retail uses would not be combined into a single store. Second, uh, there would be no bar, including a wine bar, and no application would be made for a hard liquor license. Third, the roof of the enlargement would be landscaped, the enlargement would be soundproofed, and there would be a prohibition on nighttime or weekend construction of the enlargement. And fourth, the mechanical equipment that is now in the backyard would be relocated to the roof of the building, so it would be quieter. Appro approving this application, would prohibit the owner and all future owners from having a cafe in the rear yard because the rear yard would be enclosed. It would also, while allowing an additional 1,750 square feet of retail use, would prohibit a single large retail establishment such as a 6,900 square foot establishment that 
that the buildings could currently have. Uh, there's about 3,100 square feet on the ground floor, and the cellar, which is now not used for retail space, is about 3,800 square feet. But if the application is approved, there would only be, there would be two or three smaller establishments as opposed to one large establishment. As I mentioned, we've reached out to the tenants in the buildings and have their overwhelming support. We also produced a building management plan identifying specific measures to assure the health and safety of tenants in the um, course of construction. But the community board opposes, and I believe there are three main reasons for their opposition. First, that this would be a benefit primarily to the developer and not the surrounding community. While my client would, of course, benefit, they'll be able to charge more rent for this space, I've outlined the benefits that we have been offering to the community. Second of all, a concern about the intensity of retail use in the area. And that concern is well-founded, but as I mentioned before, there would be a prohibition on having a single large retail establishment. There'd be smaller establishments. And the community also expressed concern regarding uh, pedest increasing pedestrian congestion. And our client has promised that in their leases, they would um, impose a provision whereby uh, the retail tenants would not be able to have a storm enclosure or other such impediment on the street that would, that would obstruct the sidewalks. And thirdly, there was a concern expressed about setting precedent and that this would open the door to all sorts of mirrored and sundry changes to the Special Little, Ill Special Little Italy District. And we performed a study of every single lot in Area A that borders Area A1, such as our site, and we tried to determine whether any other applicants could potentially make the same arguments that we're making, that all the other lots on the block front have, uh, have their rear yards enclosed for the most part, and that the uses in the buildings are, have been typically those found in Area A1 as opposed to Area A, and we found no such buildings that could likely make that argument. So in summary, this application would provide benefits to the residents of the buildings and the community, has a sound land use rationale, so I respectfully ask for your favorable consideration, and I welcome any questions. All right, I will go to Council Member Chen again. Uh, and can you just go through those benefits again? So you said this would provide benefits to the local community. Yes. So can you speak to those? So what, what we've offered to do uh, if this application is approved would be to enter into a restrictive declaration that would prohibit the combination of the ground floor retail spaces into a single space. So that there would either be two establishments or three, but not one. So there would not be a large retail establishment. Sec second of all, um, there would not be a bar or a wine bar, and there would be no application made um, for a hard liquor license. Uh, third, the uh, roof of the enlargement would be landscaped, so it would provide an aesthetic benefit. It would be soundproofed, and there would be a prohibition on nighttime and weekend construction. And, and fourth, the mechanical equipment that is presently in the rear yard would be relocated to the roof of the buildings, not to the roof of the enlargement, so that it would be quieter for the residents. Okay. Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. I think it's really important to hear from the tenant um, and residents in the neighborhood. Um, this building has a very long history of tenants, you know, getting harassed through construction. Um, so I think it's, it's important to hear directly from the residents, and um, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Greenfield. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm just curious, you said before that there would be benefits to the residents of the building and the community. Uh, what you've stated so far it seemed like concessions that would mitigate the impact of the additional square footage, but don't quite sound like benefits. So what exactly are those benefits that the community would benefit by having an additional 1,747 square feet of retail space there? Well, I believe it's a benefit in that, not that our client is proposing this, but that any future owner of the building would not be able to have a an outdoor cafe, for instance, in the rear yard. That could 
potentially cause a nuisance, and in closing the rear yard would make sure that something like that doesn't I mean, you happen. Got, you got that mechanical equipment over there. It doesn't seem like an ideal space for an outdoor cafe well, right now. No, but it, it could be moved to the roof. So what, what you're saying is a, is a concession as opposed to a benefit. I, I would view that as a benefit. Of course, the uh, community is free to disagree, and I believe that they do. So just to be clear, it's okay. I just want to understand what your testimony is. The benefit is that... So the only benefit is that the mechanics could be moved from the rear yard to the roof. That's the benefit. Well, the, the, there's another benefit. Right now, um, there could be a restaurant on the ground floor. There could be a bar that does seek a hard liquor license. And my right, I'm client, sure the council member will oppose that as well. Not to worry. <laughs> well, my client has offered that, that no application would be made. Okay, so it's a, it, just to be clear, it's counselor, yes? Yes. Okay, just to be clear, counselor, the benefit that you're offering is that things could get worse, but they won't get worse if we do this. That's the benefit. I mean, I, it's okay. I understand that the way you're characterizing, just generally when one considers benefit, that's generally not what we consider, right? I mean, it sounds honestly more like a threat rather than a benefit. No, to, to, be, to be clear, there's, there's no threat, but I, I do believe having a landscaped, soundproof enlargement uh, would be an improvement over this, this current rear yard. All right. I mean, I, I don't know that the neighbor, neighbors would agree with you, but we're going to hear from them in a moment. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to now go to our first public panel, uh, Toby Bergo Berguan, I believe. Terry Cued. Erica Baptiste, did I butcher your name? Sorry. Penny Jones as well. And uh, Sergeant, we're gonna ask you to put two minutes on the clock. So I'm gonna go back, Toby, Community Board Two, Penny Jones, Tenant Erica Baptiste, Manhattan Borough President's Office, and Terry Q, Community Board Two. One is not here? Okay. We'll go to Peter Davies. Is Peter here? Peter? All righty, come on up. No, no, no. You're going to go. They're going to give it. Okay. You may start to my left well, or to my right. Uh, I'll do it. Thank you. You may start. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Council members. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Terry Kood, Chair of Community Board 2 Manhattan. We place high importance on this application to change the boundaries of Area A1 in SLID for 5557 Spring Street. CV2 strongly opposes this application and had a unanimous vote to deny it. There's no land use justification for the requested change. Over multiple discussions and hearings, the applicant could not justify the addition of a structure over a required rear yard other than that it's allowed nearby but not in the section of the slid in which they chose to purchase their building. Instead of any land use justification, the applicants offered to drop an eviction proceeding against a current rent-stabilized tenant family who the applicants uh, claim live upstate. However, the children go to local public school. Dropping an aggressive eviction proceeding as a give back to obtain a discretionary action seems highly improper. Similarly, CB2 members were upset to hear that many units have been taken out of rent regulation by questionable means, that the building does not have a certificate of occupancy, that rent regulated units were destroyed or kept vacant to become part of the retail space, and that the current owners were making life difficult for current rent regulated residents by construction effects. This cannot be awarded with an enormous gift of 1,750 square feet of additional retail space. Additional retail space is a highly profitable amenity. Granting this application would reward owners that purchased a building with a highly questionable record of taking units out of rent regulated status and shown callous disregard for residential tenants. It would intensify retail units for enormous gain with no benefit at all to the residents or the community. Granting this application would serve as a precedent to other applications, including one already in process now, seeking a text change to change the subdistrict of the SLID at 2325 Cleveland Place. We do respectfully ask that you deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, you may begin. <clears throat> 
Good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Pete Davies. I'm a longtime resident of Manhattan Council District 1 and a neighbor of Little Italy, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak today so I can register my opposition to the proposed zoning text. I support positions taken by Councilmember Chin and Community Board 2. I have submitted written testimony with more details, but rather than read that, I'll simply outline my reasons uh, that this should not be approved. Why should the Council deny this application? One, setting a bad precedent for the SLID. As was noted, there is another application in the block just to the south for another text amendment that would build in and cover up the uh, rear yard. Two, loss of affordable housing. To approve this application would disrupt the stability of tenants within this building and in the surrounding Little Italy neighborhood. As stated in the applicant's submission, the developer's plan is to demolish an existing ground floor dwelling unit, replace that apartment with retail space. Preserving housing is more important than expanding retail. Three, work without DOB permits. A review of the DOB job overview records for both 55 and 57 Spring shows that a very limited number of building permits for work within the residential units have been tained, obtained over the past many years. However, during that same period, numerous gut renovations have taken place throughout the buildings. How could that happen? Four, insufficient DOB inspections of the properties. The time frame when gut renovations work took place, when protected dwelling units were deregulated, coincides with the period when Donald O'Connor served as the DOB Chief of Manhattan Construction a position O'Connor lost in February 2015 when he was arrested, along with many other DOB employees all charged with fraud and bribery related to crooked inspections. Thank you. We'll go to the next. My name is Penny Jones. I've been a rent-stabilized tenant in 55 Spring for 37 years, since 1980. I oppose this change in zoning because I oppose the construction plans of the owners. The building is very fragile as it is. I've been there for many years, and over the years when gut rehabs were done, cracks have opened up in the hallways, usually in my apartment, continually. We've had ceilings fall. I feel if there is vibration in the back, it will cause further damage to the building. Anytime there has been pile driving anywhere in the neighborhood, cracks open up as a constant. Recently, there was uh, the giant um, asphalt eating tractor working on Spring, and the building shook the entire night while that was going up and down Spring Street. The buildings, the two buildings are right next to the subway tunnel, and both buildings are at about a three degree slope. This has been covered cosmetically, but you can still see distortion in all the woodwork in the remaining unrehabbed apartments. If you go up on the roof and look straight down the back, you can see bowing in the back that suggests that the attachment of the back wall to the structure is not strong. I feel if they're allowed to do work in the back, uh, it could cause the loss of the back wall. I think if they're allowed to move the stairway, which they want to in my building, they want to move the first floor stair, it could cause a collapse of the core. If this job were done by proper, careful union labor, it would not be done because it would be seen as an impossible project. All the work they've done has been with illegal crews, and there have been considerable injuries to the day laborers, and they have just been sent home to come back the next day. The work they have done is careless, beyond belief, dirty, never cleaned, and sloppy to the point that I think if this were to go forward, it's a danger to the community. It's not just a question of inconvenience or quality of life. I think this is dangerous to the point of causing a building collapse. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erica Baptiste, urban planner from the Manhattan Borough President's Office to express our concerns with the application before you. Uh, this office originally submitted a recommendation for approval dated February 21st uh, to the City Planning Commission as part of, this, part of the ULIP process and testified in favor, citing a narrow land use lens and research into past violations by pr 
prior ownership. The approval was conditioned on an understanding that many of the concerns raised by the community board during their review period were based on actions of the previous building's owner. However, following the CPC hearing, our office received numerous calls and letters from the community stating existing unsafe construction activity on top of violations that remained uncorrected. In response to this, on March 16, 2017, we submitted a letter to the Department of Buildings regarding inaccurate filings with the OB and the impacts on the safety and health of the residential tenants of the buildings, including a lead dust report indicating concentration of lead exceeding acceptable standards on all floors of the building, no record of the demolition of the ground floor units to combine into the retail spaces, and no change in occupancy captured on permits issued by DOB when residential units were combined. DOB did send inspectors out and issued one violation due to a two-piece bathroom contrary to the most recent approved plans. Other underlying issues remain unresolved. Additionally, when the office met with the applicant team, we were told they would seek similar uses in their retail space. However, at the CPC hearing on February 22, 2017, uh, the owner stated the intent to seek credit tenants. The intention of the slid text change was to allow an existing tenant to grow and we believe we were misled as to land use intent and would not have signed off in favor of a text amendment that would facilitate additional construction impacts and potential for additional areas to long suffering stabilized tenants. Therefore, we respectfully request the City Council Land Use Committee to consider disapproval of this application. Thank you. Councilmember Chen? You're fine? Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your testimony. We'll move on to the next panel. Rachel Gristine, 237 Lafayette. David Malkins. I believe that's Bow Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. Jebba Baum and David Malkins. All right, I'll say this again. David Malkins, Leba Baum, David Malk oh, David, did you fill out twice? <laughs> okay. All right, another two. Michelle Campo, Laura Hoffman. Michelle Campo, Laura Hoffman. Okay, we'll take another one. Elizabeth Hughes, Elizabeth Hughes. No? Douglas Davis, no. Kay Webster. All right, come on down. And just introduce yourselves once again. Uh, once the panel start, once you light up your mic, introduce yourself and who you're representing today. You may begin, sir. And we have two minutes on the clock, uh, Sergeant. This okay. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is David Malkins. I'm the president of the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. Um, I urge City Council to vote against the variance sought by 5755 Spring Street, a text amendment application that would alter the wording of the special Little Italy district and overturn the zoning protections that preserves the character of this treasured, iconic New York City neighborhood, which includes large portions of Chinatown and the Bowery, as well as Little Italy. If approved, this text change would set a terrible precedent for two of the city's uh, handful of internationally famous neighborhoods, areas whose warm, low-rise sense of historic place attracts visitors from around the world. Such changes would also escalate the displacement of small businesses and the harassment and displacement of local residents. The zoning protections of the Special Little Italy District were created to preserve its character and historic sense of place. Because this district brings tremendous revenue and throngs of tourists, Keeping its character as a neighborhood is, in the long term, best economic interests of the city. Little Italy is not just another uh, neighborhood. It is unique and special. It's included in the National Register of Historic Places for a purpose. 
the special Little Italy district's zoning protections should be respected and kept intact for the health of its neighborhood residents, small businesses, and the unique historical cultural character it represents for the future of this great city. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin, sir. My name is Jebba Baum. I'm a tenant at 57 Spring Street. Uh, I've been there since 1989, rent stabilized. And uh, I can speak to the uh, truthfulness of the, the comments of Jay Bam uh, here. Uh, within one month after them uh, buying the building, they uh, issued me a eviction notice. Uh, they had no way of, uh, no, nothing to base that on whatsoever. Both of my children were attending public schools at the time. My wife works here in the city, and uh, as do I, uh, part time. And, <clears throat> they uh, have since then harassed me in many different ways, my whole family, by their construction practices in the building. We were uh, forced to call the health department, which shut them down on multiple occasions for dust and fumes coming up from below. They vented the fans in the apartment below us into the uh, rafters so that all of the fumes from the bathroom, the kitchen, come right directly into our apartment. And uh, when I spoke to them about this, they asked me not to call 311 uh, because it would affect their application. Uh, I, was I was amazed at the public uh, hearing at the uh, community board when they offered uh, verbally, publicly, a, a quid pro quo that if, they would, uh, if the uh, board would approve this, that they would uh, drop their case against me, their spurious lawsuit. Uh, I can also speak to the uh, conditions in the buildings, having been uh, done maintenance there for a previous landlord uh, 25 years ago. They're very old buildings. They've settled uh, over time, and they, are, they would be extremely sensitive to the kind of construction that is being suggested. Uh, so I, I'm very thankful to Margaret Chin's office and to the community board for uh, not supporting this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, council members. My name is Michelle Campo. I'm with the Bowery Alliance of Neighbors. I am reading a letter from Kent Barwick, who is the president emeritus of the Municipal Art Society. I don't think there is any basis for rewriting the zoning to help a developer on Spring Street attack an out of, attract an out-of-scale tenant. As you know, Little Italy's merchants are under siege and Eliminating the few protections of the zoning will exacerbate the sad situations we are seeing. Protecting the scale and texture of the neighborhood was the essential ingredient in the special district. It should not be casually set aside. I hope you will vote to sustain the position taken by the community board. Thank you for your attention to this question from Kent Barwick. I would like to add to that a little bit. Um, if this application is approved, window openings in the adjacent buildings will be covered. While these are property line windows, they have been in place for over 100 years and have been protected by the zoning that does not allow a rear yard obstruction. Residents of these buildings, who had to leave, including the president of a co-op, attended the CB2 hearings and spoke against the proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Kay Webster, a longtime resident of uh, the neighborhood since 1990. Um, I concur with the host of reasons already expressed. I would like to actually talk about um, the loss of the small business, Ceci Sela, uh, to Little Italy, the original bakery of a longtime community members, Laurent and Sarah, Sandra Dupal, who are friends and colleagues, uh, which opened in 1992. The loss was the direct result of the refusal by the developers to renew their lease at 55 Spring Street. Clearly, um, they had plans to make larger profits from this site. Um, I, wanna, I wanna speak to the what happens when you remove a small business like this from a neighborhood uh, for the profit of a real estate developer. Um, this business uh, owners were deeply committed to and embedded in this neighborhood as neighbors, as parents in the 90% low-income Chinese heritage and immigrant PS130. They ensured that every school event had generous donations from their French bakery. They were founding parents of the former Thompson Street Playgroup, 
whose parents took a derelict park building and transformed it into a local community parent cooperative nursery school paid for and run by parents with scholarships generously given. They mentored our babysitter, a young working class Latina from the neighborhood, to learn French pastry making. For-profit development with its incessant just asking for a little bit more has consequences that creates pressures that unravel threads of networks that were long in the making. It makes this place less caring, connected, and functional community it is. Those pressures, intended or not, threaten the pragmatic life of this neighborhood. Little Italy, not unlike was recently discovered regarding garment district, has a complexity invisible to the tourist. Where a profit-seeking developer sees a gold mine, we saw Owen, who would let you pay next week for copy work, a bodega where you could buy milk on credit, a boot repair that would work on that shoe in time for your big event. Uh, I'll just close by saying I really appreciate, uh, Council Member Chin, your consistent fight for affordable housing. Thank you all for your testimony today. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Okay, seeing none. Excuse me. Oh. Council Member Chen, you want to close that? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, the resident and the community members and community board for coming to testify today. And I think that as a city council, we have a responsibility to preserve our neighborhood and affordable housing. And I really want to urge the committee again uh, to reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chen, for your leadership. All right, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? Okay, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 653. And we are laying this uh, item over uh, until our next meeting. With that being said, this meeting is adjourned. We will take a five-minute recess, and then we will begin our next hearing. <laughs>